afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure that we welcome you to this uh, webinar uh, called Between Crisis and Opportunity, the Pandemic's Implication on the Economic and Energy Sectors in the Broader Mediterranean. Uh, it's a, a meeting organized as a regional meetings of uh, uh, MED Dialogues 2020 in cooperation with the European University Institute uh, and the, in the framework of the State of the Union uh, uh, 2020, which this year was also devoted to the issue of the consequences of the pandemic COVID-19. So it's a great pleasure uh, today to have a distinguished group of panelists. Uh, I'm going to introduce them uh, briefly. Um, I will uh, unfortunately also have to notice uh, that we, uh, Dr. Uh, Fernando Gentilini and Dr. Wolf, uh, the managing director of uh, uh, EIS NENA and Dr. Wolf from Bruegel uh, will not be able to, to join us. So we will have more time for, with the, for the discussion with the, uh, the three panelists and I'm going to introduce them now. It's uh, Daniel Lederman, lead economist and deputy chief economist uh, Middle East and North Africa at the World Bank. Then uh, Dr. Fahad uh, Al-Turki, vice president and uh, head of research and uh, King Abdallah Petroleum uh, um, Studies and Research Center in Saudi Arabia and uh, Karim, Dr. Karim al Naiwi, President of Policy Center for the New South in Rabat, Morocco. So I will, uh, following this order, I will uh, now uh, start the, the meeting, uh, just introducing uh, the topic. I think we all been following uh, with uh, great concern uh, the developments uh, over the past uh, three months. The pandemics have been spreading throughout the world and has had a number of uh, uh, important uh, effects, both uh, on the health, of course, primarily, uh, and, but also uh, immediately uh, in parallel on uh, the uh, economies uh, the, of uh, most of the globe. Uh, and we are now uh, obviously looking uh, with uh, uh, quite uh, a lot of uh, preoccupation about what the future might uh, bring us, uh, particularly in, in the medium, uh, short and medium term, but also uh, perhaps even in the longer term. In the MENA region, of course, the industrial production and trade flows, uh, as in many other parts of the world, have been severely carved by the uh, double crisis, uh, or I would even say triple crisis of the pandemics, uh, the, which has been uh, coupled uh, with, uh, of course, the immediate impact on the economies uh, and uh, also uh, with uh, the parallel crisis uh, uh, brought by uh, the collapse in uh, oil prices. So uh, we have a scenario in which uh, the economic uh, uh, um, situation of the global economy is uh, is quite uncertain and that uh, creates uh, some uh, questions about how uh, the economies in uh, the MENA region are going to react knowing that they have been marked uh, over the past several years but uh, important vulnerabilities uh, and that of course uh, all gone in parallel with the a number of uh, uh, questions uh, uh, in the uh, socio-political area, which uh, has already been strained by uh, increasing uh, uh, grievances uh, on socio-economic issues uh, and uh, demand for of empowerment, protest, especially uh, the demands of the uh, gen younger generation, which uh, uh, struggles in finding uh, pers perspective and, uh, and prospects in, uh, in the MENA economies. So we will try to cover all these issues. Um, I will uh, uh, now pass the floor to the, the panelists uh, that will in introduce the, the different aspects. Uh, then uh, we will have uh, uh, hopefully a couple of rounds of, of questions. Uh, so I remind uh, our uh, audience that they will have be they will be able to uh, pose questions in the in the Q and A 
modality of, of, of the platform uh, and so that we will be selecting some of those. We already have a few questions that have uh, reached us uh, beforehand and so I'm, I'm looking forward to a very lively uh, discussion. To start, uh, I will turn to, to Daniel uh, Lederman. Uh, Daniel, you have recently produced a, a very interesting report on uh, transparency in, in the MENA region. Of course, uh, I'm sure this is, uh, had been prepared even before the crisis, uh, the, uh, the pandemic crisis uh, manifested itself, but of course it becomes even uh, more, more interesting in the framework of uh, what is happening today. Um, can you uh, enlighten us about uh, how this, the dual crisis, uh, the economic and oil price crisis, uh, combine with the, with the pandemics in affecting uh, the MENA region economies and uh, what we can expect uh, in terms of uh, uh, short-term uh, growth perspective uh, uh, and uh, as well as longer-term uh, issues uh, affecting uh, the various economies of the region. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Luigi, uh, for the kind invitation to be uh, with everybody today. Uh, I'm going to uh, share now my screen. I have a, a few slides prepared. Uh, let's see. All right. Can everybody... Can you guys see it? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so um, thank you, Luigi, for mentioning our uh, report that we published uh, at the beginning of April that was uh, is titled, uh, How Transparency Can Help the Middle East and, and North Africa. Uh, well, it is true that most of the research was performed prior to the onset of uh, the current crisis. Uh, we, we, we did dig uh, in chapter one a little bit into uh, thinking through the economic and social consequences of the crisis. And we have a central argument in that chapter, which is, is about the, the costs of the dual shock. And the reason uh, we purposefully talk about a dual shock singular is because we believe that the collapse of oil prices is related to the pa pandemic, meaning that global demand for energy collapsed as the pandemic spread and the large economies of the world, uh, starting with China, then Western Europe, then the United States, uh, went into a series of lockdowns. This exacerbated the decline in demand uh, for energy and um, the oil producers, uh, um, uh, of the world were unable to counteract the collapse in, in, in demand. Um, uh, today, we have some of the world's leading experts, uh, a leading expert in oil uh, market, but let me just uh, um, uh, share with you a couple of ideas. Uh, all right, let me see. So um, this is just uh, the, I'm going to go briefly through an explanation of what we mean by the dual shock. So the, I, I just have a picture from the New, New York Times as of May 8 uh, that uh, shows the uh, outbreaks as of May 8 around the world. Uh, the issue is that when China's outbreak started and spread through Europe and then through Europe and through China onto the United States on both coasts, um, that led to policy responses around the world that entailed a severe uh, reduction in economic activity, which translated into uh, a collapse in uh, global demand for energy, which then led to uh, a fundamental uh, uh, change in global uh, oil markets. In this graph, what we're plotting is the spot prices uh, from January 2018 to, uh, 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 to the most recent uh, data that we had uh, as of early the, this, uh, uh, this week. Uh, and then the blue line was the futures curve as of January 21, 2020. The yellow line was the futures uh, oil price curve as of September 2019. So you can see that markets 
had not internalized what was going on uh, until after late January. Fast forward to March 9th, 2020, and May 7th, 2020, you can see how the futures curves ha had collapsed, e even though uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, futures traders are in, in effect predicting a gradual recovery of the price of oil uh, for delivery in uh, well into the <laughs> end of 2022. Um, and so both things are related. The onset of the pandemic, the collapse uh, in demand for oil, and the collapse that brought about uh, the collapse in prices. Now, here, there's another interesting graph that I, I, I would like to share uh, with our audience today. Uh, the World Bank, like the IMF and private banks around the world, um, do frequent forecasting of what's going to happen around the world. In our office, uh, uh, together with our World Bank economists that are spread throughout the region, we perform periodic assessments of our expectations for economic activity throughout the MENA region. And so what this graph is showing is the difference in our GDP growth forecast that we had published in October 2019, well before we knew anything about the pandemic, and as of April 1st, 2020. So it's the difference between those two forecasts. We, here we've plotted those differences for four countries, Egypt, Lebanon, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia. This is the curve of those differences or so changes in forecast of GDP growth for Lebanon. You can see that in April, not only have we revised our expectations for growth in Lebanon, uh, uh, in fact, we downgraded our expectations of growth in Lebanon by 11 percentage points, 11.2 to be more precise. But we had also reassessed what had happened back in 2019 because um, Lebanon was, uh, before the current crisis, um, facing challenging economic, particular macrofinancial issues that had already affected their uh, last quarter uh, uh, growth performance in 2019. Okay, then here's, here's Morocco. Uh, our uh, forecasts relative to October were downgraded to the tune of four, four, four and a half percentage points. But we expected in April 1st, a relatively fast uh, recovery for Morocco, expecting that it'll grow in 2021 faster than we had previously expected way back then in October. For Saudi Arabia, uh, the expected decline in growth was a little bit more uh, attenuated. And for Egypt, <clears throat> uh, it's important to remember that um, the uh, national statistics of Egypt follow their fiscal year, which ends in June of 2020. So most of the effect of the crisis uh, uh, is occurring from their point of view in the last quarter, in the last three months. So that's why the, the growth downgrade in our expectations for 2020 is relatively modest at around two percentage points of GDP. Uh, however, you can see that we expect uh, that our uh, expectations for growth in Egypt uh, in 2021 were also downgraded, and that's because uh, the 2021 fiscal year in Egypt begins July 1st. So some of the costs appear as 2021, but it's just an issue of the timing of the reporting. Now, an important, why am I showing you this graph? Because the crisis um, hasn't fully realized, materialized itself. Uh, we're uh, barely in, in May of 2020, and we need to forecast or form certain economic expectations about what's going to happen the next, uh, in the remainder of the year and well into 2021. And the reason this graph is interesting is because when you compare economic expectations before the crisis uh, took place, to those, to new economic expectations after we have some information of what's happening on the ground, that difference is arguably a proxy, a good estimate of 
the expected aggregate economic costs of the dual shock, meaning the pandemic, the policy respondents to the spread, and the collapse of oil prices. Now, all of these uh, um, expectations or estimates of the economic costs of the crisis are highly fluid and changing on a weekly basis, if not in, on a daily basis. I'd like to share four messages. First is the one that I just insinuated, that changes in expectations are arguably estimates of the expected costs of the crisis. Let me give you an example, a very stark example. The IMF, in its latest World Economic Outlook, changed, revised its expectation. It had, it had published an estimate of the global economic growth in January, and in which they said they expected the economy of the world to grow by 3.3 percentage points. In late April, uh, they published a revised version of those global uh, expectations, and now they were saying that they expected the global economy to contract by 3%. The difference between those two numbers is 6.3 percentage points, and that's a good proxy of the IMF's expected costs for the globe as a whole of the crisis. In our own report, we compare our previous uh, expectations of growth for the whole region, for men as a whole. And in October, we were saying that we expected 2020 to be uh, a, a slow growth, but in recovery mode for the region of 2.6 percentage points. Now, as of April, one, uh, in our report, we published an estimate of minus 1.1 percent. The difference is 3.7 percentage points for the region. If you interpret that as our expected costs, aggregate cost for the region as a whole of the dual shock, as of the information we had in April 1st, uh, uh, that 3.7 3 percentage points of the region's 2019 GDP adds up to over $110 billion. And uh, the most, uh, we've been tracking private sector forecasts and comparing the private sector forecasts for the region relative to what they were saying in, in December, and those numbers are getting bigger and bigger. So a, a key uh, issue to remember is that uncertainty rules, because in order to get a good precise forecast of what the costs are gonna be of the spread and of the, the, the collapse in demand for oil and many other uh, goods and services such as tourism uh, that are important for the development and growth of the region, when we need to forecast what's going to happen in the rest of the world, what policies are going to be implemented in China, in Western Europe, in the United States going forward, then we need to predict what are going to be the national policy responses, both in terms of uh, public health interventions, social, social distancing policies, but also in terms of uh, uh, macroeconomic and fiscal and social policies. And it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen. And importantly, and that's why uh, we argue that transparency is now at a premium during the crisis and beyond. Because in order to really assess what the aggregate costs are going to end up being through 2020 and well into 2021, we would need also to assess or predict how societies are going to respond to the economic shocks as well as to the public health interventions. And so there's high uncertainty about how societies are gonna respond. Will they follow the instructions of the central governments or will they go their own way? Uh, that is virtually impossible, particularly for economists to predict. So the uncertainty rules. However, just because our uh, precise estimates or expectations of the aggregate costs are uncertain, that doesn't mean that we don't know the direction of those costs. They're negative. As time goes by, I think that economists will uh, revise their expectations downwards, at least for 2020. Now, not only do we know the direction, although not the precise magnitudes of the costs, we do know from our research presented in our, our report, and I have some slides that if I have time I will share, that show that the expected aggregate costs 
across countries in MENA is highly correlated <coughs> with the uh, pre-crisis indicators of the quality of the public health systems. That is why in the previous graphs that I show you uh, for Saudi Arabia, in spite of being more exposed as a share of GDP by the oil shock, by the collapse of oil prices, it, it has a world-class public health system that will allow it, we believe, in the, in the medium to long run to come out uh, from an economic standpoint less scarred than countries uh, where the public health systems were less prepared. Unfortunately, uh, the, the greatest concern in terms of the capacity of the public health systems to absorb the shock is worse in conflict-ridden economies than uh, in developing or high-income economies of, of, of the region. Now, in terms of national policy responses, we are arguing Daniel, for some... Two, two minutes. Sir. Two minutes. I'm, all, I'm, I'm just going to finish here. Uh, we're arguing for a, a sequencing of policy responses, but uh, a sequencing without delay. What does this mean? Because it sounds like an oxymoron. We believe that the uh, first uh, priority in the current crisis situation should be addressing the public health crisis. This requires, uh, a, a hopefully, smart uh, uh, use of social distancing policies, combined with testing to the extent that it's available <laughs> uh, 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 relatively widely, with transparent sharing of information, uh, both about the spread, about the economic costs, and about the policy intentions and the reasons for the policy intentions of sharing that, inf that set of information with the broad civil society so that uh, uh, everybody can be on the same page without by minimizing uncertainty of what are the social objectives and what we're trying to accomplish. However, it is true that not just in Lebanon, but across the board in the developing countries of MENA and even in the high income economies of the G of the GCC, there were policy challenges that predated the onset of the crisis. So the, the trick is to shift gears, get into crisis mo mode, protect, protect lives, protect livelihoods to the extent that's possible to protect them in the current crisis situation with, with shrinking uh, fiscal space, but to begin thinking immediately about the future that we want to build across MENA after the pandemic subsides. And that requires planning, and it requires planning to chart a clear path, a transparent path to building trust with broader civil society and the citizenry of the region so that once the crisis mode subsides, we can get on with rebuilding these economies in a new way that offers enhanced trust in the uh, a public sector from the point of view of the citizenry and prepare to do the needful things and the reforms uh, that will be different, will be different than the reforms we were, expe we were expecting in October and December. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, of course, a lot of uncertainty and uh, difficulties in uh, planning uh, appropriate responses, but obviously the question of uh, getting it right in the sequence and getting it quickly uh, and flexibly, uh, it's, it's key. And uh, obviously the question of transparency plays an important role. We're probably returning to this, uh, to this topic. Uh, I will now turn to Dr. Fad uh, to, uh, if you can uh, shed some light on the energy dimension of the crisis, of course, uh, energy, oil, uh, and gas revenues uh, are uh, extremely important in the region, as we all know, uh, both in oil producing countries, but also for uh, non oil producing countries uh, in terms of uh, the impact on uh, uh, remittances, uh, transfers, and so forth and so on. So what, what, what are the reverberation of the present uh, oil crisis uh, shock, uh, which is, as we know, linked to the pandemics. So now you see this uh, developing uh, 
both in, in countries like Saudi Arabia, who have uh, important uh, uh, Vision 2030 to, to uh, implement, and in countries that, uh, of course, uh, do not have the, the, uh, the oil riches at the disposal of their economies to, to uh, play a role in their uh, fiscal space. Uh, thank you for the introduction and, uh, and the invitation. Uh, I would like to uh, say that while the, um, this panel, so, uh, uh, the topic of this panel is the implication of um, the pandemic on the economy and energy, I would like to note that the COVID-19 pandemic above all uh, is a human tragedy uh, and perhaps is the most um, significant civilizational threat that we have uh, uh, faced in, uh, in our life. Um, COVID-19 has now spread to uh, more than uh, 4 million people uh, in more than 180 countries, um, a rate of infection that we have never seen in more, in more than a century. Uh, there is um, a, a significant challenge to even um, well-funded uh, healthcare system uh, that is now currently struggling to, to, to keep up with, um, with the spread of the virus uh, across, across the, the globe. Uh, so while we discuss the economic and, and the energy impact, we, we also need to, uh, to keep that uh, in mind um, at the same time. Economically, the socioeconomic impact of this pandemic is, um, is, is tremendous and huge. I mean, we, we saw Daniel talked about the global growth being negative um, this year negative three compared to um, a three point uh, something uh, earlier in the year, positive. So there is a reduction of six percentage point. Um, I would say even next year, we would likely to see um, a stagnation of growth. Even though the IMF forecast about four or 5% growth next year, I think that is very optimistic. I think the ramification of, the, of, the, of this pandemic is likely to carry on with us. Uh, into, into next year, especially that unemployment is rising significantly in many countries, advanced and developing countries. SMEs are going out of business uh, and also uh, not only SMEs, we keep on hearing about even large companies uh, facing difficulties uh, with, their, uh, with their cash flow. Um, it's only recently where some countries started to think about uh, restarting the economy. Um, China, um, the US, uh, there have been uh, a lot of thinking about moving and open, opening the economies within the next few weeks and few months. But even though I, from my perspective as an economist, um, I think uh, starting a business, opening a store is way easier than uh, reinstating confidence uh, between, uh, among consumers and also restarting uh, aggregate demand. So there will be a very uh, a challenging environment uh, ahead of us um, across all sectors, not only on the energy side. Um, beside, beside the immediate um, uh, impact on health, if we turn to, 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 the, um, to the economy, and the, inner, the, the impact of the pandemic has been huge on, on, on the economy, the energy use, uh, the CO2 emissions, uh, and so on. Um, in fact, CO2 emissions is likely to decline this year by 9% uh, compared to, 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 to last year. And also, according to the IEA, uh, countries in full lockdown are expecting an average of 25% decline in their energy demand. Countries with partial lockdown um, have seen their energy demand drop by 18%. If we look at the actual data uh, for the first quarter, we will see that demand uh, for energy dropped by 3.8%. And this is for the first quarter, where the impact was severely in, in China uh, throughout the, the quarter, but also on uh, during March, when many countries in Europe, North America, Middle East, and elsewhere uh, have started to uh, control movements uh, of their citizens. Um, for overall the year, uh, 2020, this current year, uh, the IEA is expecting demand to, be, to, to fall by 6%, basically wiping off a five-year of demand growth um, uh, that we saw over, over the past five years. 
And this is the, lar the largest decline in demand that we see in 70 years. So a massive reduction. If we turn into, if we turn our attention to um, the impact on breakdown by fuel, um, we see that interestingly, the low carbon fuels, uh, and in particular natural gas, nuclear and renewable, seems to be more resilient uh, to the downturn compared to coal uh, and oil. Um, and this is something uh, I think it's, uh, it's an important message that we need to build a resilient and sustainable uh, economic future after the, after the pandemic. Um, demand for uh, coal uh, was hit hard by, uh, by, quarter, by the first quarter, declining by around 8% um, compared to, the, to, to last year. Uh, there are three reasons why it was um, why there is a significant drop in in, coal, in demand for coal. First is China, where the, it's a coal-based economy, uh, which is the hardest hit country in the first quarter by the pandemic. Um, and second is the competition coming from a cheap gas uh, and continued growth of uh, renewable is also capping the demand for uh, for coal. Uh, in addition to this, uh, seasonal factors like mild weather also cap demand for coal. Um, we look at the natural gas. Um, natural gas also, as I mentioned, seem to be more resilient than, than other sources of um, fossil fuel. Um, the IEA projects that demand will, be, will still fall by, uh, by around 5% this year compared to last year. However, there is a a different uh, forecast within the market uh, and, uh, and a great level of uncertainty related to where natural gas uh, is, is likely to land in terms of growth and de for, uh, for demand on natural gas. From being flat this year compared to, to last year to seeing a growth, a positive growth of 4%, and this was uh, projected by uh, flats. Uh, but even any of these numbers is significantly lower than last year, which saw demand for natural gas increasing by 11 uh, percent. Um, if, we, if we look at uh, the oil, and um, uh, I would take about uh, five more minutes to, to focus on the oil, given that uh, it received a lot of attention in the last um, a few, a few months. According to our estimates, which we have published in, in the first week of, um, of, of May, so two weeks ago, uh, we see the fall in, uh, in demand in the first quarter to be around 14.3 million barrel per day. Uh, and we expect the yearly decline in demand for this year to be around 7.3 million barrel per day. And as we noted, uh, this is the largest decline in demand for oil to be ever recorded. Um, uh, and if we look at, and probably this is why the, the oil market received a lot of attention in the media uh, over the last few months, in addition to the discussion about the OPEC agreement and the OPEC plus agreement um, that fall apart in, in March and then reinstated uh, in, early, in early April. Um, most of the discussion in the media was focusing on uh, most of the headlines, more focusing on the demand side. It's always a demand side story, given the pandemic and the COVID-19 impact on, the, on different economies. If we look at the statistics, supply in April increased by no more than 3 million barrel per day, um, following the, the collapse of, uh, of the deal, while demand at the same, for the same period, April, fell by 30 million per, per day. So it is a massive demand, uh, demand uh, decline uh, relative to, uh, to, to, to an increase in supply. Um, there is though a positive sign in this dynamic. And I think uh, this is, uh, speaks to many of the economies within, within the region. You know, a well-supplied um, and cheap oil market uh, will definitely help restart the, the economic engine, especially for oil importing countries, uh, not only in the region uh, here, but also for large economies like China and India. 
Uh, this is important if we are thinking about restarting the global economy and re reversing this minus 3% to a positive number next year, um, especially that the oil importing countries um, share in the global GDP outweighs that of the uh, oil exporting countries. And in fact, we've seen some countries, there are some reports that shows uh, as China comes back to or rest restart the economy, taking advantage of such low oil prices. Some reports mentioned that 95% of large factories uh, resumed operation in, uh, in China since March. And even more significant and related to the energy market, some reports are showing that oil imports for the first week of March are back to the pre-outbreak uh, volume above uh, 10 million uh, barrel per day. Uh, what does this mean for, for the oil market? Probably it means a V-shaped recovery in some fuels, especially uh, diesel and gasoline um, demand moving, moving forward. Though this does not factor in the risk of a second wave of COVID-19 that is being uh, talked about in, uh, uh, in the media and also um, um, among some research centers that focus on, on this area that is likely to happen within the next fall. Overall, if we exclude that, our expectation is that demand is likely to be down for this year by 7.3 million barrel per day before rebounding by 5.5 million barrel per day uh, next year. Uh, on the supply side, uh, the, the huge OPEC plus supply cut and also the North America production losses uh, during the last few months are likely to push supply back in line with uh, demand, um, but not until uh, next quarter. Uh, our expectation is that the glo global supply will be falling by 7.3 million per, per day uh, this year, which will help stabilize prices and probably uh, push um, or put prices on an upward, a gradual upward uh, trajectory, uh, which if you look at prices today, we've seen um, an increase in Brent above, above, above the $30. Though the whole dynamic of the oil market is causing a massive losses in, uh, in major um, oil producing companies. If we look at the stock market, we see that global oil super majors uh, are um, witnessing an erosion of their market capitalization by 40 to 50% over the last uh, the last six months, so a major challenge uh, for many uh, oil producing companies. Even yeah, in addition to this, yeah, in addition to this, the market um, the liquidity in the market has been very tight, which might reflect a major impact on the supply and the value chain in the in the in the, in the um, uh, moving forward. On balances. Um, I think even though the OPEC plus agreement uh, will help in avoiding a worst case scenario for the oil market, it is not going to be enough to restore market balances in, in, the, second, in the second quarter. We might see some improvement in the third quarter. So this is because of the buildup in the inventories as well as absolute volumes and uh, will will result in a deep discount and shut-ins as operators are unable to find buyers for their oil or for their crude. The next few months are going to be extremely challenging for the oil market industry. And if the pandemic continues, the challenge will continue down the road. Um, and if we, uh, if we look at the implication on COVID-19 on capital investment within the industry, which have um, declined significantly this year, I think there is a major challenge in terms of um, ability of the market to supply and uh, meet demand uh, in the future years. Um, uh, I would like to end with, with a positive sign that we've seen emerging as demand losses um, are subsidings and global activity is improving. Um, if we see uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, infection curve um, flattened, 
um, then probably the industry will uh, will avoid uh, a significant uh, implication of this pandemic. So thank you, and back to you. Thank you, Dr. Fad. I I take notice of uh, of the of the bright side of the rather gloomy uh, picture that, uh, of course, uh, a well supplied um, market uh, oil market can potentially facilitate the restart of economies, even though probably there are more structural uh, factors uh, in the aggregate demand that will play a role globally. Uh, but also, I'm sure that we will uh, be interested in looking at uh, various aspects of resiliency of certain, of certain uh, um, uh, energy markets like nuclear renewable, renewable, but we get back to that afterwards. I will now turn to, to Karim uh, and uh, I'd like to ask you uh, to get a, a bit more on the, on the socioeconomic uh, intersection uh, of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemics and the consequences uh, on, uh, on the young generation and the, and the new social contract for, for uh, the region. I think those, those are, there are quite a number of uh, potential uh, socio-political implications uh, from the pandemics and uh, they, 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 get, they get inserted into uh, trends that, that we have been witnessing over the past years. So uh, what, uh, how, how do you see the, the situation on that front? Uh, thank you, uh, Luigi, and it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be with you all. Um, let me uh, maybe uh, start from the viewpoint of uh, what we see here in Morocco uh, and then uh, uh, try to answer your, your, your question. Uh, basically, I would like to, uh, to, to structure uh, uh, my input in on four, four dimensions. The first one will be uh, where, where we were when it started. What was the situation? Uh, and I will tell you about Morocco, but I can st say a little bit, a bit more about the region in general. Uh, and also, what, what's going on in terms of, uh, you know, the economy? Uh, what is the impact? Uh, and I'll say a few words about uh, also uh, in terms of uh, the, the what kind, how it is affecting the various components of population. Uh, and then, what kind of policies that will be the, for the third point are being uh, done? Uh, and, and then I'll conclude on the political economy uh, of reforms and what it means and how, let's say, uh, we can use the crisis uh, to create a sort of momentum for, uh, for reform and what, what it will take. Uh, and I think it's uh, something that would be uh, both true for, for the side of the Mediterranean, but also uh, for the European Union, I guess. Uh, so the first point where, where we are. Uh, we never recovered from the financial crisis, basically. We never fully recovered from the financial crisis. And basically, we've lost 1.5 percentage points of, of GDP permanently, which is the, uh, the potential, uh, potential growth as reduced. We've never recovered because also the elasticity of, uh, of uh, GDP growth to unemployment uh, to employment has been low and stubbornly low for a couple of years, which is a case in many countries as well. Uh, from that standpoint, we never recovered. Central bank balance sheet never recovered. That's a lie to say central banks have recovered. There's the, the, we never got out of quantitative easing, including in particularly in advanced economies. Debt is still very high. We never recovered in terms of the debt of levels of debt, uh, look at the G20 level of average GDP uh, debt, we never recovered. We never recovered also in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of trade, basically, and, uh, and uh, protectionist uh, uh, sort of uh, wars, trade wars, which are, for me, a consequences of the financial crisis. So basically, we were sort of in a sort of uh, transitory period, transitional period all around the world. And that's true also for many countries of this region. And if you add to that conflict, of course, uh, if you add to that uh, geopolitical interactions, power rivalries, countries like uh, uh, Libya, or of course, further uh, 
for the uh, East, uh, you see that really we never recovered. And these are all interlinked uh, dimension and aspects of things. They're not isolated. And I can do a long list. Uh, in Morocco, we had several shocks, of course, and uh, uh, the financial crisis. Then came, uh, came uh, the Arab Spring, 2011. Uh, and a couple of other idiosyncratic uh, and domestic originated uh, shocks. So basically, when the crisis hit, uh, the margins were already uh, quite uh, quite uh, eroded, but there were still some margins because, in terms of fiscal policy, we had rebuilt some of the margins, you know, since 2014. Um, so. This pandemic happens and we create, because of the policies basically, a, it's a man-made engineered crisis because of confinement policies that we've basically stopped the economies all around the world. And of course, it's a very powerful uh, sort of uh, policy because there are many transmission channel, uh, channel, channels and they are compounded each other's. I mean, if Morocco stops, uh, basically traveling and uh, of its own citizens, the others are not coming as tourists to Morocco. Foreign demand is collapsing for Morocco and, in, and then you can, you have these cards of bad dependency and uh, self-reinforcing sort of dynamics. Uh, so we are affected through, of course, remittances um, that are lower but quite resilient in Morocco. And of course, the tourism sector is one of the I would say of the strongest channel of transmission because it's highly intensive in unskilled labor. It affects employment uh, quite significantly. Uh, that's a very strong one. We are, un unlike uh, my friend uh, Fahad, we are positively affected by lower oil prices because Morocco has, uh, has no oil production, so it's a net importer. So for us, it's a very positive shock on the terms of trades. And we estimate that number by 3%, which percentage point of GDP as a positive shock to the economy. The, in, earlier on in the decade, there was again another positive shock, which was about 4%, 4 point, percentage point of GDP. So for Morocco, it's a very strong and important transmission challenge, particularly on the sustainability of, uh, of, external, uh, of external accounts. We estimate that we lose about 3.2 percentage points of GDP every month of confinement here in Morocco. Basically, the nature of the confinement, we have estimated this very detailed uh, exercise by regions and by sectors, that every, every, if we, every month we lose 3 percentage points. So I concur with Daniel, and I'm glad to see that the World Bank has revised its, uh, uh, its provision on Morocco. It was what, what, what minus 1.9 a couple of weeks ago, which was not realistic. And I see that here you have minus 4% or something, if I read correctly, the table. That's what we have for Morocco for this year. Basically, two, three months, that's minus 12, uh, minus 6, plus, uh, plus 3 of which is the base sort of uh, baseline growth. So we're losing basically 6% 6, 6 of GDP this year. Uh, that's a very strong shock to the economy, and it's a particularly strong shock on, uh, of course, the informal sector, on laborers uh, and vulnerable workers. Uh, we're talking about you know, four to five million people that are seriously affected, and that could, of course, we have to be careful that they don't fall into poverty. Uh, and uh, there were some very strong measures. That's another thing: is that this crisis, in terms of your questions, uh, Luigi. These crises are also showed nations for what they are. And I think we all reacted as expected. Uh, you know, Swedes reacted as Swedes, uh, Germans reacted as Germans, Moroccans reacted as Moroccans. So it's a good moment for us in terms of the social fabric of the nation, being together and solidarity. Uh, Morocco has created a special fund, an urgent fund, that has been uh, funded by uh, voluntary contributions uh, by all Moroccans, companies, etc. And it's a quite significant amount. It's three percentage points of GDP uh, that is being used to support those informal workers I mentioned. So in terms of, you know, the crisis as, a, as, a, as an engine for, for reform, the crisis as, 
a, a togetherness force for countries to to be able to uh, sort of get together and do the, the appropriate reforms is an interesting, uh, beyond of course the sadness of uh, families that are losing people. And, but from a policy perspective, uh, it's I think an important um, dynamic that is not to be lost. So basically the reforms that we were, uh, and I think many countries actually is very true of the European Union, the reforms that we should have done 10 years ago basically, uh, and that we have not necessarily done, are still to be done, basically, are still to be implemented. Uh, I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, you know, education, uh, capacity to create an, an economy that is, you know, has a strong innovation uh, sector. Uh, Morocco is a typical middle income country that has, you know, uh, needs to increase, improve its, uh, increase its productivity, increase the, 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 the skill level of its uh, stock of uh, labor, but also uh, you know, have uh, good ed education for new, uh, you know, or new kids going out of the education system. So that's something we have been sort of uh, lagging behind in terms of reforms that has to be uh, tackled very, uh, very seriously. It takes uh, serious, uh, serious work. It takes long-term commitment. Uh, it takes to stay uh, very focused on the horizon. These are difficult reforms. And I think uh, we're in better shape today uh, to engage in those reforms. I think also in terms of the nation being together uh, with uh, an important spirit of solidarity. So there's also an important reform that has been talked about for a long time, which is reform of the fiscal uh, system and the, uh, you know, the sort of a more equal and more efficient, more uh, redistributive uh, fiscal policy and fiscal uh, uh, fiscal support and also the subsidy schemes that we have that are not very well targeted uh, and that should be transformed in uh, conditional cash transfers for the poorest uh, households has also to be reformed. It has been quite difficult because of the political economy around this subsidy. And I think now there is a momentum to do, uh, uh, to do more. Uh, so basically everybody has been affected, firms, households, the budget, of course, fiscal policy, the monetary policy has to play its role. We don't have a full-fledged quantitative easing policy, but more sort of specific interventions from the central bank to make sure that credit flows. Not easy, uh, because there are issues in terms of the transmission mechanism uh, from the bank, uh, from banks to firms, from banks to, uh, to, uh, to also households. Uh, so that's something that has to be monitored very carefully to make sure we don't, uh, you know, create uh, permanent losses, permanent destructions of companies uh, that are otherwise profitable. I mean, as economists, we really want, of course, a, you know, a sort of uh, a st creative destruction where you have Schumpeterian entrepreneurs that emerge and the other inefficiencies that go bankrupt. But at the same time, because of uh, uh, short-term liquidity issues, we don't want companies and firms that are otherwise competitive to, to disappear. And it's very difficult to make sure that you have targeted, efficient interventions, uh, because we were not prepared to that. It was already a big challenge for Morocco to distribute these cash transfers I mentioned uh, to uh, informal and poor workers and households. It has been quite successful so far, but we didn't have a general system, a sort of, uh, you know, um, registrar of all the poor, etc., to be able to convey efficiently uh, support to them. Uh, so, what I would say in terms of, in conclusion, uh, I could elaborate a little bit more on the impact of the economy, of course, the spread, the uh, uh, external pressure, current account, etc. But my that we return to this uh, time is yeah. uh, my yeah. sense is that basically we are all in this together and we are all more vulnerable today than, than a couple of months ago, of course, because we have a sort of uh, uh, went into very, uh, very strong fiscal expansion uh, and also monetary policy has done uh, you know, a lot. So, uh, so I think we are all more vulnerable to another shock where it's going to come from. Uh, I don't know. But uh, we can imagine that in the foreseeable future, there will be additional shocks. So my, my sense is that uh, 
building on this nation, you know, of this feeling that uh, as nations, uh, we are all sort of together uh, in uh, reacting to this crisis with the spirit of solidarity. There is a momentum to engage in serious reforms that have been lagging for uh, uh, for a while. And my sense is that uh, uh, in Morocco, there is a good uh, sort of outlook and prospects for that uh, uh, for that uh, to happen. I'm not saying it's easy, but my sense is that is, there is the consciousness that uh, we are vulnerable. There is also the psychological effect of this crisis, which you shouldn't uh, underestimate at the individual level. It's a call for one, each or one of us uh, to think, to reflect on what we do. Uh, it's a pause, an imposed pause in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the way we live that is fruitful for gathering energy, taking distance and rethinking uh, how we do normally. So I hope that decision makers, policy makers, we will be able to, to take this opportunity so we'll come out of this crisis uh, stronger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karim. I, I, I take the point of, uh, that, of course, uh, the, the, the shock, the extremely strong shock can uh, be uh, produced. Uh, positive incentives to uh, uh, reforms that were long overdue and hopefully will, this could be done in the spirit of uh, uh, even international cooperation. So that, that's a particularly important uh, aspect that perhaps we can return into it, to it. But uh, on, uh, staying on the question of, of reforms and policy responses, uh, perhaps I would turn back to, to Daniel with the question that uh, we had received previously that was on on uh, um, what kind of uh, uh, specific uh, policy response could be uh, put in place by uh, by governments, uh, taking also into account uh, the fact that you you uh, stress in your report uh, transparency comes at the premium. So, if you could highlight uh, one or two areas which could be particularly uh, important in this very moment. Uh, to be built in, in in the in the government policy responses to the crisis. Uh, thank you very much, Luigi, for the for, for the very important question. Um, I think there's three um, sets of policy worth uh, thinking in terms of the sequencing with the, uh, uh, without delay, and these three uh, policy areas are about the immediate needs. So the first one is uh, the public health interventions. Uh, clearly, um, until uh, there's a vaccine, there's going to have to be some social distancing type of framework uh, in societies across, across the world in order to try to minimize the loss of lives. Now, this air, it's very difficult to predict and to give very precise advice about the extent or magnitude or intensity of the lockdowns or social distancing policies that can be implemented in different, in different countries. In poorer settings, where there's a lot of informally employed, vulnerable households uh, that can't afford to be locked down for extended periods of time because they literally live hand to mouth. And so one there, there's no way out of this, but to have smart uh, uh, social distancing policies and to invest in parallel as much as possible, both in the existing public health infrastructure and looking forward to try to set up in a hopeful <laughs> near future, uh, the infrastructure that's going to be needed to, dis to keep expanding testing and eventually the distribution of therapeutics, the common line, and uh, the vaccine. And this takes time. We won't build such infrastructure in, uh, even in countries uh, like uh, Tunisia or even Egypt from one day to the other. In countries that are more fortunate, like in the Emirates or in Saudi, they're much more advanced. They have 
pre-existing redundancy in their health system, which has prepared them to absorb the shock more efficiently. Um, so that's the first area, public health. It's very difficult to give very precise, uh, specific advice in those areas because so context is specific, not only across countries, but even within countries. The situation of the public health system in Tunis is very different than in Southern Tunis. In Cairo is very different than in Upper Egypt. And, and so one has to take into account that the source of livelihoods is very different and therefore the public health interventions need to, uh, uh, to vary. The second area is this, uh, what we're calling disaster relief to maintain a minimum level of consumption. This is support um, to vulnerable households and Morocco has laid a path as Karim was describing in terms of quickly being able to roll out a system for disbursement of cash assistance for vulnerable and informally employed populations. This is not a minor feat. In some countries, our best guess estimates of the size of the informal, uh, in, informally employed labor force can exceed 70% of the, of, of the labor force. So this is a, this is a very difficult uh, issue that most of the Western world and even in China does not have. In China, they have these problems in some areas, in rural areas, but China has the advantage where digital technologies have huge levels of penetration and of use. MENA has a lot of penetration of mobile telephony, but they've never been, they, they, there isn't the infrastructure, for example, of digital payments that can be adapted in the short run to channel resources to those that most uh, need it. And these, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to roll out this assistance in cash and transfers unconditionally almost to vulnerable households in order to induce a vast share of the national population citizenry in the region to stay at home. If assistance doesn't get there, they cannot stay home because they have to eat. Otherwise, we're going to have widespread localized famine in poor areas of the countries. And the third area that is for immediate attention is indeed the area of transparency. This has two dimensions. One has to do with the sharing, open sharing of information, data, the scientific evidence about the spread, about the testing, about uh, mortality rates. In order to enable our leaders to clearly communicate and explain what's going on, with the vast majority of our citizenry. It is very hard to get uh, compliance with even mild programs of social distancing if people don't trust the state or the public sector. And, and, and many, many countries here have a, a pent up deficit of societal trust in the public sector. And now we cannot wait any, any longer. If there's one clear lesson of what has happened around the world is that clear, transparent communication with the citizenry, regardless of levels of education, regardless of, ideolo of ideology, regardless of territorial localization, is fundamental for, bring, for both protecting lives and livelihoods because it makes uh, the social and policy and economic policy responses more efficient. We hoped that this push for greater transparency and open communication between the state, the public sectors, and the broader citizenry will flourish in the months and the years ahead so that we can have more informed, fact-based, evidence-based public discussions with think tanks, with academics, with the best minds around the world, not only national, about what are the best reform packages, social policies, macro financial and fiscal policies, even in the aftermath of this crisis. We cannot stress, <laughs> one cannot exaggerate the importance of transparency in the current juncture, and we must acknowledge 
that in the recent history of the region, we have failed in the transparency angle. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. That's a very important point. Also, the fact that uh, uh, much uh, a debate is much needed on, on what are the appropriate response, and that needs to be, uh, of course, uh, widespread and evidence based. I think that's, uh, in addition, it's, I think it's broader than the, the, the issues that you have highlighted that, that pertain to the main region. I think it is uh, clearly uh, an issue for, for all of us. Uh, perhaps if I can turn back to Dr. Fahad, I have a couple of questions uh, on, again, on the energy areas. One, one is, uh, um, if you can take away the, the po possible, hopefully uh, we are not going to have it, but uh, impact from a second wave of the pandemics, what are the, are the downside risks uh, to the oil price in 2020? Uh, that they, you feel we are not uh, uh, looking at them at the moment. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> if, uh, they, if we are not uh, capable of anticipating, then they could also perhaps have another negative impact on the V-shaped recovery that we hopefully have. And then a second question, which uh, I highlighted before also, I think uh, you stress uh, the resilience of, of uh, renewable, even in this particular uh, circumstances and, and also gas and, and nuclear uh, clean energy in general. I think uh, many analysts uh, seem to agree that uh, the, the trends we have been seeing before the crisis seem to remain on course. So how do you assess that and what, what, what is your take on that? Um, thank you. Very, very important uh, questions. Um, I think on the, on the first question, Mm. It's um, if I add an, if I would add another um, component to any downside risk to to oil prices, uh, it would be the ability or the lack of ability of countries to recover from the current crisis. And as I mentioned in my introductory remark, um, it's easy to say that we will restart the economy and open uh, economy. Opening a business um, uh, is going to be way relatively. It's not. I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's way easier relative to reinstating confidence in the system um, among consumers. Remember uh, confinement and uh, curfew in many countries and restriction of movements and travels been with us for the last uh, three, uh, for the last two to three months. Uh, you may allow travel uh, on principle, but whether there will be consumers that are demanding that service uh, within the next few months, that's another, another story and another difficulty. So restarting aggregate demand is going to be relatively harder than um, opening and restarting businesses. So that's the second, uh, probably, um, risk factor. If we see, um, and, and we always, um, in the T20, we, T20 is, uh, is Think20, which is one of the engagement groups under, under the G20. And we initiated a new task force um, to focus on COVID-19 and on implications of COVID-19, uh, not only on the economy and on the energy, but also on social aspects. And there is a risk of um, that uh, we're not paying attention to, which is the soft side of the implications of COVID-19 on consumer confidence and ability of consumers to, to go back to, uh, to previous businesses, to previous behavior. Uh, so that's on the first question. On the second question, uh, so things are always relative. The reason why we see stronger growth in renewable and low carbon um, sources of fuel this year um, is because two major factors. One, on the renewable side, there is a huge capacity improvement, um, investments are coming from last year into operational uh, this year, and that's why we see a 5% growth. Um, on, on nuclear, uh, we, we're seeing uh, probably a decline of 2%. So there is a still a contraction there, but if you compare it to other uh, sources of fuel, like coal or oil, uh, 
uh, it's relatively lower um, uh, impacted. Um, and um, um, whether this will continue or not, it depends, I think, on two factors. One is what the governments will do in terms of their priorities for directing their spending. Um, and two, uh, whether consumer behavior uh, following the pandemic uh, will continue uh, to be uh, to be the same in terms of um, uh, lower demand on uh, either travel, uh, low vehicle uh, transportation, uh, be it on land transportation or air or sea. Uh, so that could be uh, could be a major factor in determining uh, what the direction would be for low carbon fuel uh, in the future. Thank you, Thanks. Dr. Frank. Uh, now I have a question on, uh, on targeted social protection. I think, uh, Karim, you made uh, the example of Morocco. And uh, I think uh, this is particularly important, as mentioned by, also by Daniel, the question of uh, informality and the informal sector and the way they necessity to protect workers from the informal sector. Uh, I mean, can perhaps we we look at um, specific policies, what, what works and what doesn't. I mean, and perhaps Daniel also has some, perhaps a broader view uh, through the region. Uh, Karim and, and then Daniel, if you can jump in on this. Well, I can tell you what we've been doing here. There was, uh, of course, the formal sector is about 4.5 million. Uh, Morocco is, a, for those who don't know, is about 35 million people. Uh, uh, we we have uh, you know 4.5 out of a workforce. If you include the, the labor force, is about 11 million people, 1 million unemployed uh, globally. Uh, plus 4.5 in the formal sector. Uh, five, let's push it at five with the public formal sector. Uh, the broad sense 5.5. Which, which are identified that they have social security number. Uh, so those were, they got support through the, their companies, but there was a, a support from the fund I mentioned, uh, direct support on their, on their payroll, if you wish. Uh, the second one that is a bit less problematic is the Moroccans that have access to a, a, a medical insurance scheme for the poor, which are, known and identified as such they have a card uh we're talking i think 8.5 million people something of, of the like um it's per household uh, they could be overlap with the others by the way you can be uh, you can be in that medical scheme and also being a a, a formal sector that is at the minimum wage let's say uh, and then we have people in the informal sector about four millions uh, uh, that have no basically have a day-to-day -day sort of uh, um, income uh, which are very difficult uh, for them to smooth their consumption over time low savings etc there was a system that was invented uh, on the on the spot if you wish uh, through mobile phones and identification of people and then they had to go to uh, uh, to uh, banking agencies and uh, you know, these cash transfer agencies with the money in cash. Uh, we didn't have the uh, fintech like, you know, some countries in Kenya or uh, Nigeria can have. Uh, so that's where you see that resilience is important and uh, thinking of these issues, you know, and that's why I mentioned the necessity, the very important reform for a country like Morocco to have a conditional cash transfer system where uh, and we spend a lot in subsidies, but in a very efficient way, untargeted subsidies on oil, uh, particularly gas, for cooking gas, uh, which can be a couple of percentage points of GDP, depending on the price of oil and gas on the global market, which is very inefficient. That was initially, you know, something to reduce the uh, uh, depletion of forest, you know, for cooking oil, but then it was distorted and used as a source of energy in agriculture for pumping water or in houses just to warm up water or in hammams, you know, this uh, collective uh, public bath where uh, 
consume a lot of the burn energy to warm up water. So, uh, so I think it's a wake up call and people have realized, oh, how can we help? You know, even if you want to help, you need to have the, you know, the militaries, they know this very well. You can think of any, any strategies execution. So if you don't, you, you cannot execute, you have a problem. So that's, that's very important. And uh, I'm not too worried about the informal sector to restart, you know, as soon as we, uh, we let people go back to their normal activity. I'm worried about uh, those workers at the, you know, two, three times about the poverty line, basically minimum wage and two, three times the minimum wage, let's say, uh, that are working in uh, restaurants, in the tourism sector, in the broad sense. Uh, and some of the workers, the formal workers, we need to worry about them also, unskilled formal workers that are working in light manufacturing activities that have been affected. So it's a very, uh, it's a very complex, uh, you know, set of, uh, set of effects that you have here, but it's not necessarily the, the poor, the informal sector that is going to be the most affected. I mean, we have to support them and to give them a lifeline during this time, but then, uh, you know, those, those unskilled workers in the formal sector are also to be, uh, uh, you know, to be helped, and we have to help for the transition, help the companies. Uh, it's a very sort of uncharted territory for public policy, and that's where I join uh, Daniel. That's what we do in our think tank, but also at the university. It's really to introduce this culture of evidence-based policy making. And we're not talking only about randomized surveys I mean, uh, and tests. We're talking really evidence-based, whatever the toolkit of public policy analysis in the broad sense. It can be very qualitative, it can be quantitative, it, it has also a very strong lead to participatory democracy, what you called in the US deliberative democracy, where you have to consult people because sometimes they know, and most of the time, they know better than your models. You know? <laughs> Just, uh, you know, in region, and it has to be region specific, you know. That's another reform I, did, I didn't mention, which is fundamental for a country like Morocco, is to be successful in the implementation, in the de decentralization mechanism, you know, in the, what we call here regionalization. It's the devolution of power and uh, in terms of the, of the democratic institution, but also the administration you know, the, that is quite centralized in Rabat that has to go you know, locally, and which has been very difficult to achieve, with very strong resistances uh, from the center uh, here in Rabat. And this notion of innovation, you know, I'm sure if you ask, and I will conclude on that, I see you uh, becoming impatient, Luigi, but that's very important. Uh, it's linked to the transparency that Daniel was calling for. And I'm, uh, it's not transparency, it's not competition for the sake of it. It's also for innovation to open space you know, for society. Uh, it's not just the tech technocratic. And I'm sure if you had asked, you know, a couple of Moroccans, young Moroccans, uh, let's say you gave them a year to come up with a very efficient system that uh, use the new technologies to transfer this money, they would have done it, you know, but nobody asked them. And, and, and at the same time, we don't have the, uh, the infrastructure, the general infrastructure to promote innovation for them to come up with that because no policymaker can come up with these ideas and that's where competition is interesting and you know uh, level playing field and the discipline and efficient regulation in many sectors where, where you want this to you know this enormous energy of our young population uh, to contribute to the future of their country by giving them the space to innovate. I think that, that is something that we are also, I hope, uh, realizing with this, uh, uh, with this crisis and the needed response uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to produce as a, collectively uh, as, as a nation that is, uh, that is together, and which I, I insist is very, uh, very important. And it's fundamental to conduct complex reforms where you need confidence and trust you can achieve all the reforms if you have confidence and trust in general in the society, but not polarized nations where it's very complex to do anything, basically. 
thank you. Sorry to have been a bit too. No, no, thank you, Karim. No, I, you, 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 you know, you, you have a strong supporter for, for these ideas in myself. So, I, 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 but I just wanted to uh, also be able to, to address other issues. So if Daniel wanted to jump in on the issue of social, targeted social protection uh, throughout MENA and countries, so which countries seem to be able to, to address it in a best, better way, you probably have the overview, Daniel. Um, very important question. I, I, uh, have, I must say that I couldn't agree more with what Karim was saying. Uh, in terms of the targeting in the middle of a, a crisis, in a sense, many countries are coming to the game um, uh, with a big gap uh, because uh, most of the countries didn't have uh, pre-existing targeting mechanisms precisely because the social protection system relied on uh, uh, general uh, subsidies, usually in-kind subsidies such as energy subsidies, r rather than targeting. So unlike, say, countries like Mexico or other countries in Latin America, uh, the, the mechanisms for uh, distributing targeted transfers to the most vulnerable uh, populations that live hand to mouth uh, is, 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 is a huge undertaking, but it can be done. Uh, MENA, as I mentioned earlier, has one advantage, say, over sub-Saharan Africa, which is that mobile uh, telephony has a much higher penetration rate, even among the poor. Uh, the, pr the problem is that we're behind sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to digital payments, because if we had widespread use of mobile money accounts, then you could use those accounts to make deposits uh, uh, financed by public debt during the, uh, 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 during the crisis. So the amazing thing that Morocco has been working on is that they're setting up the targeting mechanism as well as mobilizing uh, the national resources, creating fiscal space uh, 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 through a broad societal response to the crisis and then to challenge them. It is really remarkable that they can do so so quickly. Now, the truth is that in Morocco, there have been a lot of technical thinking <laughs> about uh, these reforms to the social protection system well in advance, but it can be done. And I hope that there's more learning uh, 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 region wide based on the Moroccan uh, experience. And it should be generalized in our opinion. And there's no other way to go about it except via uh, mobile, the use of mobile uh, 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 telephony, because with large shares of the population being informal, there's no real uh, informational base for targeting. Um, I was gonna say something about uh, the risk of escalating poverty and transforming, especially the developing uh, emerging markets of the region into much poorer <laughs> uh, uh, societies. Uh, th this is, a, this is a, a real risk. And uh, uh, next uh, Tuesday night, uh, Washington time, we will be publishing on our uh, website for the first time our MENA crisis tracker that provides some back of the envelope calculations about the potential increases, percent, proportional percentage increases in poverty rates uh, that is a function of the poverty elasticity with respect to GDP and the expected uh, GDP losses as the crisis has gone by. Um, I don't think I have time to share the screen uh, though I would love to, to, to share those back of the envelope calculations, which will be made public next Tuesday night, Washington time, uh, in our website of the um, uh, Office of the Chief Economist for MENA of the World Bank Group. Um, but the numbers are staggering. The numbers are staggering. And uh, uh, these estimates uh, um, uh, rely on poverty GDP elasticities that assume that the, the shock uh, will not affect the distribution of consumption across households. So they're, they're what technocrats, e economists, poverty economists call inequality distributional uh, neutral uh, el elasticities. That's a huge assumption when we know that both from the pub public health side as well as from the economic side, in many countries, it's been the most vulnerable that are the most exposed both to the fatal consequences of the spread and to the uh, socioeconomic e e losses. And so uh, it's 
I can't <laughs> overemphasize how important it is what Karim was just talking about. And one cannot exaggerate, cannot be over exaggerating uh, the importance of transparency. Because if society does not trust what the central governments and the authorities and the political leaders are trying to accomplish, both with the social distancing policy, all the public health intervention, and the socioeconomic disaster relief policies, these can be go on for a long, long time, up to a point that uh, it doesn't matter how many people have cell, cell phones, it'll be too late. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I see the clock is ticking. We have still uh, five minutes to go, but I, I have an important question, perhaps as the last question open to all who want to intervene, in, and it's looking at opportunities. Uh, we, um, there is a lot of talk about uh, the impact on globalization uh, that pandemic will have in the, uh, in the long run, and many, many uh, people uh, say that uh, certainly that could have an impact in shortening the supply line, reshoring production uh, operations uh, away from uh, China back to uh, European, the Mediterranean uh, courtyard, if you want, for uh, enterprises uh, uh, in Europe and in, in the MENA region in the Mediterranean. So I, I just was wondering, what, what is your take in, in, on that in terms of potential opportunities for all the countries uh, in, in, uh, in, in the MENA region. And uh, what is there, is there a role for, uh, say, smart uh, industrial policies that can trigger that uh, uh, on the two shores of the Mediterranean? I mean, see, that's also calls uh, into uh, question the, what the Europe can do for, for that. Yeah. Is that Yes, the total. Okay, so um, I think that's a, that's a very interesting, I mean, uh, point. Uh, there is always, uh, uh, within crisis, there is always uh, some opportunities that we should, we should look at. Um, maybe in the darkest of times, we should uh, always uh, focus on, on the half uh, full of, um, of the cup uh, and, uh, and see the emerging uh, uh, signs. Uh, I think, um, from my perspective, um, while this pandemic uh, creates a massive challenge to the way we live, uh, the way we manage our economies, it also creates an opportunity for, for the global community uh, to show solidarity and, and united, uh, which we, we start seeing um, uh, during the meetings of the G20 here in Saudi Arabia, especially in early March with, um, with the extraordinary um, uh, um, a G20 leaders summit uh, and the statement that was issued uh, and including uh, within that statement there were a number of initiatives that are being um, rolled over as, um, as, uh, as, we, as we advance. Uh, one of them is, is the agreement that was signed um, by uh, international organizations and many, uh, and many advanced uh, uh, countries on, um, on, on May 4th. Uh, which raises funds for, um, for by, uh, pay, uh, finding a vaccine for, for the virus, but also supporting less fortunate countries. Um, so I think the role of multilateralism and the coordinated international uh, measure uh, uh, as a result of this pandemic uh, is, is very important and is, it is an opportunity. In addition to that, I think it is an opportunity to, uh, to reform. Um, many of the domestic economic policies. And we've seen that here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Karim have talked about it. Daniel talked about it uh, as well. Uh, and there is a lot of thinking about um, creating physical stimulus, um, scaling up uh, transfer uh, measure um, or cash transfer measures, um, improving the social uh, protection um, reviewing the tax uh, system uh, and also introducing a lower interest rate to, uh, to, support, uh, to support economies um, as they recover, uh, allowing SMEs to have access to credit uh, above and beyond what they, what they had before, uh, just to live, make them live through the crisis. Uh, and most importantly, there should be a serious thinking about restarting global supply chain 
uh, and re, re, revisiting the slowdown in global trade, the so-called global uh, trade war, uh, we should that should be should be revisited in light of this uh, pandemic, as we realize that we, uh, as a global community, depend on 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 one on one another. Uh, there should be a revisit of um, access to medical supplies. We should we should look at these uh, these uh, issues, especially for developing and less fortunate countries. Um, protection for wages, um, managing uh, the, the the significant increase in un, in unemployment is also um, uh, an opportunity for for the countries to introduce the reform uh, within their economies. Thank you. Thank you. Karim? Yes. Anybody? Maybe. Uh, Karim or Daniel? Okay. Yeah. Yes, maybe uh, uh, one question was there about education and, uh, you know, uh, how we, we did. That. I'm also a dean of uh, at a university, so we went digital overnight and we couldn't believe we could do it. But what I can tell you is that it has unlocked the psychological blockage uh, in people's mind and in the professor, also the faculty. And now we have decided to move 30%, 3-0 of all our courses online on average. Uh, actually, we are still assessing, but uh, for, it's of course a university, but it seems to be much, uh, much better. And as a father, uh, also my son Walid, who is watching, I say hello, by the way. Uh, he's as always, he has also went through that in Canada where he, where he studies. So I think for the education system, uh, this, the digital will, will play a stronger role. And uh, we, let us see, but first assessment we have, it has improved quality. The question was about high school and of course, uh, uh, younger children where inequality and social backgrounds still play a fundamental role at these uh, early ages in society. And I think policymakers have to look into this very carefully and make sure that we don't lose, you know, it's not so long in the end, but we don't lose, you know, this generation and they don't have. Uh, so again, these are very detailed policies. They should be, uh, you know, decentralized. They should be at the closest level of the population. They cannot be dealt from a capital city in any country. So. Uh, on uh, your points, I would like to emphasize only one point, uh, Luigi, which is very important and dear to our heart, the work of our think tank here is the relation with the European Union uh, and uh, with Africa in general, and of course with Morocco in particular. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to retool and rethink our relation. Uh, there's ongoing discussions, and I saw a question from Adele, which uh, he has put uh, from Chatham House here, about the reconfiguration of global value chains and the demand for security uh, that will come up from populations. Yes, of course, uh, there will be a demand for, uh, for, for security in the broad sense from their government, where they will maybe relocate some of the productions and that's where you talked about smart pol uh, industrial policy. Uh, how smart can it get? Uh, it can be very smart uh, if policymakers just provide the framework and the appropriate environment, particularly, uh, you know, uh, the trade rules and particularly uh, rules of origins, etc. There's a lot to do in the, within the MENA region and with the African continent as a whole. Uh, but this needs, you know, political leadership and the space and I think institutions like us, you know, think tanks, academia, international institutions, of course, the private sector, for the most part of it, uh, can, uh, can do something. Uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, uh, to, uh, you know, we've, we've discovered that, you know, uh, something that can be optimal from the point of view of, uh, let's say, a firm is not necessarily optimal from the point of view of society. It's the typical sort of public good. And that security of a certain number of goods, according to the population demands, I mean, this is why we policymakers are here, in the end, is something that they want to be a sort of guaranteed by the government. So I think we should work that together, uh, both sides of the Mediterranean. And there's many, many improvements to be made 
we need leadership uh, from our standpoint as a think tank and a university you can count on us uh, our commitment our passion our energy our researchers in you know finding collective solutions uh, in open uh, dialogues respects and tolerance which i think uh, is even more important, the capacity to dialogue, 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 super dialogue, you know, that makes us understand each other uh, is, a, is a, a fundamental dimension, I think, of, uh, uh, of this world, and particularly one of you mentioned it, uh, where the multilateralism has been challenged uh, by uh, some superpowers, and for us, uh, in a way, we're bystanders, you know, in essence, bystanders watching the, all this in front of our eyes. I think there's something to do together around the Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Karim. Daniel, one last word. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been an excellent panel. I've learned uh, a lot from, from Karim and, and, and Dr. Al-Turki, so I very much appreciate the invitation. Uh, I'd like to end with a couple of words. One, on the idea of smart uh, industrial policies. Uh, it suffices to say for now that uh, it's, a, it's a topic that's close to my intellectual and professional heart. I've spent uh, decades uh, doing research on, on R&D policy, uh, digital economy, uh, labor markets, and the like. But it, it suffices to say that uh, even the smartest, most well-designed, well-intentioned, smart uh, industrial policies can be very costly when the underlying economic uh, system suffers from distortions. For example, if you have a dysfunctional electricity sector or you have big um, uh, state-owned monopolies in mobile uh, uh, telephony uh, that raise the costs unnecessarily of doing business in urban, especially in rural areas, you need the, the amount of fiscal resources that you have to mobilize in order to succeed in setting up, say, industrial parks or something like that is much higher. Needless to, needless to say that if you have um, a misaligned, or a appreciated exchange rates, then it becomes really expensive to have smart expert promotion policies. So that, that's on the uh, industrial policy side. Um, on the regional and globalization issues, there's, uh, there's a similar issue here about sequencing without delay. Clearly, we need to revisit at some point this business of the killing of the world trading system through a thousand cuts at some point. But in the immediate, and we need to start thinking now about it, but there are urgent uh, issues that are emerging because of a lack or because of a leadership vacuum in the global economy. And there's a real uh, uh, chance that many countries, especially the poorest amongst, among us, that will suffer from beggar thy neighbor policies on the medical equipment, PPEs, but also the vaccines, and the therapeutics as they come online, and food. There's a real need for some sort of global coordinating leadership to prevent hoarding among the countries that have the productive capacity of agriculture and food uh, items, as well as of medical equipment and eventually vaccines and therapeutics, that they will hoard them, keep them to themselves, lowering domestic prices, but raising global prices of food and therapeutics and vaccines uh, to uh, heights that will make it unaffordable for the vast portions of the global population, which will mean that the virus will keep <laughs> circulating longer than it has to, and B, that we will have another um, epidemic, pandemic of famines around the world. And it would be better if we didn't have the current vacuum of global leadership to coordinate countries in order to minimize the temptation to pursue better than neighbor policies. But in the absence of that, it would be great if emerging powers, economic powers such as Saudi Arabia, other members of the G20 
would take the leadership mantle and work together what, both with the WHO and the WTO and the European Union to try to bring about a much needed global leadership and coordination in the areas of food supplies and medical equipment supplies. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I think uh, uh, on, on this uh, note, uh, on uh, call for more cooperations amongst important uh, actors, uh, I, I think we, we come to a close to a very interesting panel. I uh, like to thank uh, the panelists, uh, Dr. Fad Al Turki, uh, Dr. Karim Alanawi, and uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Lederman for the very great uh, contributions they have done to the extremely lively debate. And uh, thank you. And I hope uh, we will have uh, more opportunities to discuss this important issue. Thank you, thank you very, very much. much. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. It's a pleasure.